Robert Draper, who is Jeff Duncan? <laughs> Jeff Duncan is a conservative freshman, a Tea Party freshman from the 3rd Congressional District of South Carolina. And uh, it's a good question, actually, that you're posing because um, I think a lot of people, in, in, even in the House Republican leadership, don't know who Jeff Duncan is. Uh, uh, Duncan um, uh, is really the protagonist of my book in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, on a couple of levels, I think he's, he's worth considering. First, because as one of the more conservative Tea Party freshmen, he's the straw that stirs the drink in the 112th Congress. But also his experience is that of uh, a guy who's trying to learn how to, to make himself known in the institution, a body of 435, and he's trying to, uh, clamoring about for uh, a way to be more than just uh, one of 435. And so uh, I think that tension between being very powerful as part of a group and trying to exert himself as an individual is present in the book. How did you hook up with Jeff Duncan? By chance, uh, I, the uh, right after the midterm elections, Peter, I, I decided I wanted to do this book, I, uh, and um, once uh, I convinced my publishers to let me do it, I um, uh, then showed up to the orientation meetings that uh, the freshmen were having here in Washington in the middle of November, and I just grabbed Duncan in the hallway. He was one of uh, two or three people walking in, and uh, told him what I was up to. Did you know who he was at the time? I did not. I, I mean, I knew his name. You know, he was one of these '87 Tea Party freshmen, but I knew nothing else about him. And, and he was one of a few people I accosted that day. Uh, and uh, but then we sat and talked in the coming days. And I, I liked what I liked about Duncan is he's a very forthright guy, very ordinary, and so I thought, you know, this guy could be my everyman as I sort of uh, use, he's sort of the vehicle through which we learn how a bill is passed, how one uh, tries to um, uh, exert oneself on a committee. And, uh, but then the additional dimension of him becoming, uh, being voted by Heritage Action as the most conservative member of the entire body of 435 House of Representatives uh, was an added bonus. D did that surprise you after you got to know Mr. Duncan? Uh, not especially, no. No, he's from a very conservative district, and, uh, and when he ran for um, Congress, uh, he ran on a set of principles. All these guys pretty much ran on something called a pledge to America, but his was ratcheted up. I mean, his, his was very specific in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the right to bear arms, uh, the belief that uh, God should not be routed out of government, but instead should be an, an uh, integral part of it. And so, um, uh, so, no, his conservative bona fides were, were pretty clear to me. What's his view right now about the 112th Congress and their legislative process and progress? I think he was frustrated by it. I mean, it's, uh, uh, he believed that um, the Republicans um, compromised too much and uh, that in the debt ceiling deal, for example, he did not vote for it, uh, did not vote for uh, a number of the continuing resolutions used to fund the government because he believed that uh, uh, government w uh, was still spending too much, needed to be slashed more. In this, he parts company uh, from uh, his own leadership. And, um, uh, and, and what makes Duncan relevant is that um, uh, he's from a conservative district, and that's fine. He should, he should represent them to the best of his abilities. Uh, but uh, beyond that, um, he and um, a couple dozen or so um, very conservative Republicans have succeeded in dragging um, his entire party uh, to the right. Uh, to the point where the bills that they have passed have had to satisfy a lot of these very conservative uh, Republicans and stand very little chance of being ratified by uh, the Senate and passed on for the president's signature. What is his view and the view of the freshman class, the Republican freshman class, of Speaker Boehner? Well, um, I think uh, they're ambivalent. Now, now, Duncan is a little bit more charitable towards Speaker Boehner than, than a lot of the other Tea Party freshmen whom I um, spent time with. Uh, Duncan likes Boehner personally, um, but he does not feel uh, any more than any of the other Tea Party freshmen do a particular allegiance. And this is where um, the 112th Congress is very different from, say, uh, uh, the Congress that we saw during the Newt Gingrich Revolution. I mean, when Gingrich came in with his 70-something um, uh, freshmen, these guys were utterly beholden to Newt. I mean, they, uh, uh, Gingrich's contract with America, his go pack tapes that they would listen to to learn how to fundraise and learn how to message, uh, were uh, uh, completely absorbed by them, and they were completely reliant on, on uh, Gingrich. He was their fearless leader. Boehner is not. Boehner um, uh, took note of the Tea Party wave, reckoned that he could either uh, be crushed by it or he could surf it, 
and serve it, he did um, uh, to the point where he became Speaker of the House for Minority Leader. But uh, uh, the freshmen are well aware that he is not of that movement, and that tension has also been present um, throughout throughout the legislat uh, legislative session. We're going to put the numbers up on the screen. We're talking with Robert Draper. This is his newest book, Do Not Ask What Good We Do, Inside the U.S. House of Representatives, talking about the 112th Congress. The numbers are up on the screen. Mr. Draper, what's the role that Alan West plays in the freshman class and in Congress? <laughs> uh, equal opportunity offender, I think, more than anything else. Uh, the, uh, uh, West is, um, without question, uh, the, uh, uh, the most famous of the 87 freshmen. He, he was a Tea Party sensation before he was ever elected because uh, in uh, 2009 he gave this uh, so-called bayonet speech uh, in, in, uh, in which um, he exhorted uh, uh, his, uh, his audience to pick up their bayonets and, and charge the enemy to victory. Uh, but I say equal opportunity offender because although um, West is very much a Tea Party freshman, I should mention he's um, uh, from the Fort Lauderdale area of Florida, uh, he, um, he wasted very little time upsetting leadership. Uh, I, in fact, I met West um, uh, on the set of Meet the Press and, um, uh, and while we were uh, doing Meet the Press, he happened, David Gregory of, uh, of NBC asked him um, uh, what things should be cut, and, and West said everything should be looked at, including defense cuts. Uh, no sooner had we gotten off the set than his cell phone rang, and it was Buck McKeon, uh, the uh, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, saying, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, West wanted to be on this committee, but nonetheless said, look, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, I know where the low-hanging fruit are. Uh, there are things that need to be cut. Uh, as soon as he did get to town, um, West uh, took one look at the calendar that Majority Leader Eric Cantor uh, had put forth that would um, involve uh, for this particular session, congressmen spending less time in Washington and more time in their district. And West announced this is exactly backwards. In fact, we have so much to do that we should be spending more time in Washington. And of course, Cantor was offended at that too. Uh, but, um, but finally, to your question, uh, West has actually played a role, to the surprise of many, perhaps even to himself, of convincing um, a number of freshmen that, uh, that there's no point in looking for a 100% solution, that 70% that is better than, uh, better than nothing. And he was instrumental in bringing freshmen on board for the debt ceiling, debt ceiling deal, among others. A lot of sports metaphors, a lot of movie metaphors, a lot of military metaphors. And for West, it's nothing but military. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. He was, uh, he was discharged, in fact, after a, a, a harsh interrogation that nearly led to a court-martial and imprisonment. In fact, as I note in the book, at the time that he was sworn into office, um, had fortune turned a different way, he would just be winding down a, a multi-year prison term in Fort Leavenworth. And, and, but West, uh, uh, who I think is a, a really remarkable guy and, uh, uh, for all the outlandish thing he says, things he says, uh, 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 nonetheless still sees everything through the prism of the military, still walks around with all of his information in a, uh, all of his books or briefing papers in a helmet bag, uh, uh, still uh, has the bearing of a, uh, of a guy from the Army, and, um, and when he's had qualms with leadership, uh, has uh, often compared them uh, want, uh, wantingly um, to uh, the military leadership that he himself has experienced. Why do you devote a chapter to Sheila Jackson Lee? Because I think that, that Congresswoman Lee, uh, Congress, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, is, is uh, um, emblematic, first of all, of, of um, the progressive dynamic of um, the Democratic Party. But I think more than that, um, of this theme that I pursue throughout the book, of how uh, congressmen are all sort of um, entrepreneurs and all trying to get their piece of the pie. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee's a very controversial lady in Washington. Um, she's not even well liked amongst her own Democratic Party, in part because uh, she uh, insists upon speaking on every subject, insists, on, insists upon um, amending every bill, be it Republican or Democrat, which infuriates Democrats when they put their own bills out and they're expecting full support, and here she is um, uh, fine-tuning everything. Uh, and, and also, um, she's pretty tough on her staff. Uh, and, uh, and so she's, she's not well-liked, and yet um, 
she's a very, very effective spokeswoman for her district in Houston and, uh, and is beloved and has won by margins of ranging from, say, 50 to 70 percent. Uh, so, uh, so she, to me, uh, um, is, you know, a good case study in um, how you can be sort of effective uh, at home and, and the